Well, as Brother Austin said, Luke chapter 11, that's where I'd like you to place your bookmark. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight. Luke chapter 11. This is the comparative account to Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus talks about prayer. And so this may be the less familiar of those two passages and that's why I would like to spend our time looking at it in the lesson tonight. I appreciate so much the kind invitation to be with you tonight. I appreciate people of the book and I appreciate spending time in God's Word. And so I commend you for your efforts and appreciate being here with you. Prayer is a deeply personal thing. We actually live in a world at this time that is still rather prayerful. You can see it in events like the young man who passed out on the football field a few months ago. And what did everyone start doing? They started praying for this young man. Prayer is still deeply rooted in our culture, especially the South. We know the South. We are a praying people in the South. But prayer, is a pray, a prayer especially is part of our culture. And in, in that way, it's not very different from the first century Jewish culture. The Jews of the first century had grown up hearing prayers and being led in prayers and having prayer services. And that's why there's something stated in this text that catches my attention. Let's begin, please. Luke 11, verse 1. And it came to pass... As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You may not have caught it in verse 1, but I want you to zero in on that, that verse and see. He is praying. When he stops praying, his disciples turn to him. And one of them says, teach us to pray. These men had grown up in a culture that prayed. But when they hear Jesus pray, it is not like any prayers they have heard. There's something different in Jesus Christ's prayers. There's something that catches their attention and they want to know how he does it, why he does it, what's behind him doing it like he does it. And so I think we can, I think we can learn a lot from their example, their inquiry into who is this man that prays in this way. If you were to look at Matthew's account, you would see seven statements. Here in Luke's, you see six. I want to challenge you tonight. Only one of those statements, both accounts, only one of those statements is purely material in nature. The rest lean heavily on on spiritual things. You know what the text says? The daily bread. That's the material thing that he mentions. The rest of those things are very, very spiritual in nature. I want to challenge you to think through the way that you pray. Is it purely physical in nature? Is it purely spiritual in nature? Where are we heavy and where are we light? And so what we're going to do is work through this text. You're going to notice five things in this text and I want to draw your attention to them. Number one, our prayers must be in reverence. Look again at verse 2. So here's the, here's the statement. Verse 2, and he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's a couple of elements about that we need to make sure we appreciate. Number one, our Father is an expression of unity and commonality. Our Father suggests we share Him. He is the Father of all faithful believers. And Jesus expresses that in His prayer. Our Father. He doesn't simply say, My Father, to the exclusion of others. Our Father. Jesus is the Father. Or excuse me, God is the Father of the faithful. And so Jesus expresses that in His prayer. And in prayer, we unite people. This is typically why we, we use 
uh, inclusive language on the prayer. When we're talking to, to God on behalf of the congregation, we will say things like, be with us because he is with us. Our Father because he is our Father. And while that is important, I would argue that the second phrase is just as equally important. He says, hallowed be your name. That's where this reverence comes in. See, Father denotes some respect, but hallowed be your name, that demands respect. We have an exalted privilege as God's people to be able to come to him in the avenue of prayer, but we cannot forget who we are speaking to. This is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the beginning and the last. This is the Creator and Sustainer of life. This is the being whom Isaiah said, He is Yahweh and there is no other. There is none like Him. Do you recognize that's who you're going to in prayer? The being who spun the universe into existence and the being who keeps it spinning? Certainly there is depth and substance when he says, hallowed be your name. Yet we live in a culture and we live in a world, folks, where God's name is, is so trivialized. We live in a world that, that takes that name as if it means nothing. We can't go anywhere in our world without hearing God's name blasphemously used, can we? But, but see, we are a different people, aren't we? We are a people who hallow that holy and perfect and righteous name. We want to be careful with it. Now, I'm not going to go to meddling, but I am going to make a point here, and I think we need to give some consideration to it. It's gotten rather popular to say OMG, OMG. We want to text OMG, we want to say OMG. Folks, that's, how's that any different? How's that any different than blasphemously using God's name? We have got to be careful with that exalted name. Did you know the Jews, the Jews wouldn't say the name Yahweh for fear of blasphemously using it? Well, our culture is not that, is it? You, you see Jesus going to God in prayer and he says, hallowed be your name. Go look at Leviticus 24 with me, please. Leviticus 24, Leviticus the 24th chapter. You may be wondering, what in the world does Leviticus 24 have to do with prayer? Well, I think it has a lot to do when we're talking about this hallowed name business. Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, verse 10. Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other, out, uh, each other in the camp. The Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shilamith, the daughter of Dibri in the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody that they might of the Lord, that, that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take outside the camp him who has cursed. Then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall surely stone him. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. Ooh. Got a little uncomfortable all of a sudden, didn't it? Folks, here's a story of an individual who carelessly handles the name of God and how Israel responded by God's command, don't miss that, is take him outside of the camp and stone him. And don't miss over the statement about all the congregation laying their hands on this man's head. They had to get as far away from that as they could. Folks, when we go to God in prayer, Luke, 1, or Luke 11 and verse 2, Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our prayers must be in reverence. Number two, back in this text of Luke 11, we need to pray 
for his recognition. Notice verse 2 again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I think essentially what we have here, folks, is a twofold request. Essentially, it boils down to God, may others see you and see a whole lot less of me. How much better off would our world be if we all had this on our minds? What I want, what I want is for people to see the greatness and the glory and the splendor of God Almighty, that they may too hallow His name and they will think less of me and more of Him. You know, that is rooted in the, in the, in the children's songs we sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, that's rooted in the fact that God is the original light. That, that, that's rooted in that teaching in Matthew 5. We let our light so shine before men that they may see God, right? That's exactly how we're supposed to be. You, you look at Peter's statement, a similar, a similar statement in 1 Peter 2. He says that the Gentiles may see you and glorify God. Folks, this has got to be part of our prayer habits, part of our prayer life, that others may see Him and come to better appreciate Him. Come to better observe his magnificence. Come to serve him. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Surely you've seen that here. That's part of it, folks. I want him to take preeminence. And I want him to be the central focus of me and my prayers and of my life and of my family and of my house and of the congregation and of where I have influence in the community. I want people to better see him. I think if we'll pray that regularly, we might accidentally end up doing it. We need to pray for his recognition. Number three in this text. We pray in reliance. A little bit further in this text, Luke 11, verse 3. Give us day by day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread in some way, in some translation it says. This is the only part of this prayer that is purely physical in nature. Did you catch that? We made the point in the beginning. That's something we need to make sure and see here again. This day our daily bread. I am ashamed, and I know that this is probably not describing just myself. Far too many of my prayers lean on this. God, give me next week and the week after is bread too. <laughs> we live in a physical world. God in no way ignores the realities of living in a physical world. And yet what he does is he challenges us to think about this world differently than the rest of the world and to live in this world differently than the rest of the world. And what we do, instead of building the bigger and better barns and laying up the goods and the treasures to last us eternity, we pray for today our daily bread. What I want is not an abundance. What I want is just enough. I want just enough. Just enough keeps me going to where I can continue to hallow his name. Just enough keeps me going to where I can still give him the recognition that is due him. I don't want a bunch. I just want enough. We, we need to think about this, this phrase, daily bread. Throughout the New Testament, we have this pushed against us that we are to be content with what God gives and yet, I know that in our culture today, we wrestle with this very point because we, we are supposed to be consumers. We live in a fast-paced world, and you're supposed to want more. You want more, get more, earn more, make more, and that's the way our culture is. But that is not the way we are. I want us to look at Philippians 4, please. Philippians, the fourth chapter. Philippians, the fourth chapter. Philippians, the fourth chapter, in verse 10. We all struggle with this. And I think in some respects, this very well might have been exactly what caught the disciples' attention, is the fact that Jesus barely mentions any physical things. 
but this is an affront to our culture today as well. Uh, Philippians 4, verse 10, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, thir sh uh, though surely you also did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, that, that verse 13 doesn't necessarily fit to the T-ball team, okay? He's talking about in the context of God strengthening him through hardships. He, he says, I have learned. That's not something that he automatically knew. I've learned. I have committed myself to understanding this and appreciating this, that I'm going to be content with what I've got. In fact, I think that little phrase there, I've learned to be full and to be hungry. We live in a world, we live in a part of the world, I should pray, probably say. We don't know how to be hungry. We know how to be full. But even being full sometimes distracts us. Folks, we've got to better appreciate the simplicity of Jesus' prayer. I just need today's bread. I don't need next week, next year. I don't need next 10 years. I need today's I have got to learn to be content with what I have. That drives us to a deeper place of simple reliance upon God. Do you see how that's important? That is precisely why it's just the daily bread, because then tomorrow you're going to pray to God again. God, I need the daily bread today again. You understand the difference there? That's why you rely on God. That's why it's a daily thing, because you need to ask God again and again and again and again. We pray in simple reliance upon God. Oscar Wilde once said that true contentment is not having everything, but being satisfied with what you have. That's contentment. You know, that's what Paul said. That's contentment. Being content with what you have. And I, I want to stress this point because I know sometimes this is an area we struggle with. That is not to say, and this point is not to say, we have no right to pray for the physical needs. But I would challenge you. I would challenge you. And if you're a note taker, I'll throw you some verses here. We're not going to read these. But James 5, 14, 3 John verse 2, Philippians 1 verse 9, Colossians 1 verse 3, and verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 5, 25, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, 3, 1, 1 Timothy 2, 8. All those verses are about the physical needs in most respects, but of other people. I think I can speak for most people to say that when I pray for physical needs, it's, it's generally a lot of other people's physical needs. But that is exactly what we see demonstrated in the text. We pray for the sick and their physical needs, but we need to be careful, folks. We need to be careful. That praying for physical needs do not distract us from the more significant things of this life and our reliance upon God for all things. We need to pray in reliance. Number four, we need to pray for reconciliation. There's your $3 word. Notice the phrase, verse four. This is back in Luke 11, verse four. Luke 11, verse four. He says, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. The, the concept of reconciliation is a biblical concept, and we are reconciled back to God. The concept is essentially that we are restored to the appropriate and proper relationship. That's reconciliation. Now, how often do your prayers reflect that simple truth? That what I want, more than anything, is to be right with God, to have things with God the way they are supposed to be, that I can be before Him as I am supposed to be. You see, if our prayers said something as simple as that, that God, what I want to do is just simply be right with you, then what's going to happen in our regular living, in our daily life, is we're going to try to be right with Him. We're going to try to maintain that relationship with the Holy God. We're going to try to get sin out of our life. This is essentially the motivation to be right with God. 
Folks, we, we've got to think about this, this concept. In a world today that is wrestling with our purpose and wrestling with our reason for being here, you and I know why we are here, don't we? I know why I was created. I was created to have a relationship with God. That's it. Oh, there's other things, sure. But that's really it. This part of that prayer, forgive us of our sins, it drives at that very point. God, help me to remember the reason, the purpose behind my creation, behind why I'm here and what I'm supposed to be doing while I'm here. You see, we, we live in a world that doesn't want to talk about sin, that doesn't like the concept of sin, and yet sin is that one thing that severs that tie. It destroys that, re that relationship. It takes you away from God. And Jesus' point here is be working, be praying, be living in such a way that you can have a relationship with God. How much better off would we be if our prayers reflected that truth? If we really simply just wanted to be right with God? You know, I, I'm not saying that you need to pray for the forgiveness of sins every single time that you pray. Maybe you didn't sin between prayer in the morning and pray at lunch. I don't know. That's your business. We had a conversation, as preachers sometimes do, is the individual that prays at the beginning of the sermon or the beginning of the service, forgive us of our sins, and prays at the end of the service, forgive us of our sins, and you kind of think, what did y'all do between? <laughs> but, but the simple truth is, what I want is to be right with God. And every prayer I utter has got to reflect that truth. Number four, we pray for reconciliation. Number five, we pray for rescue. Look again at the text. This is verse four, Luke 11, verse four. He says, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's an expression here, a willingness to not only get away from sin, but a willingness to follow God in pursuit of that getting away from sin. See, we've got to be willing to follow the directives of God, be willing to abstain from this world and abstain from those sinful practices of this world to be right with God. You look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, there's no temptation that's overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. I've heard that verse thrown out. It was one of the first verses I was taught. And, and folks, that does not teach, that passage, nor Luke 11 and verse 4, it does not teach that God will not allow you to be overwhelmed in this life the point is, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to handle. But I'm going to tell you, folks, God gives you more than you can handle all the time. God allows you to have more than you can handle all the time. I had a good friend just a few weeks ago whose wife passed away with cancer. You think that's more than he could handle? Yeah, it's more than he could handle, but at, but at the root of it, we have opportunity to pray to God for rescue and reconciliation and reliance because every time you are overwhelmed in this world, it's a reminder that you desperately do need God. Just back to the point of praying for our daily bread, to, to, to trust in Him to rescue us and to take care of us. Folks, do you really trust that God's going to do what He says He's going to do? That He doesn't want you in sin? that he doesn't want you to go into that old way of living. He wants you to be right with him. Our prayers need to, need to rely upon him. That though we may be tempted and though we may be tested and though our faith may be tried, what we can continue to do is look back to him. He is just and he is faithful. And we can have faith in the faithful one. What a beautiful thing, folks, to think about the fact 
that I can rely upon the God of heaven and earth, the creator of life, and he, he hears me. Let me, let me. let me say that again. The God of heaven and earth, the creator and sustainer of life, he hears Devon Harbor from Lumberton, Texas, every single time I pray. What a thought. And yet that's our God, folks. A subtle, a subtle expression in prayer, a subtle acknowledgement in prayer is that God, I sure don't have all the answers, but I know you do. I'm going to give you a few practical considerations from this that, that I'd ask you to consider. And this hits at public prayers and private prayers. Just three things for you to think about. Number one, prayer is not preaching. Prayer is not preaching. God knows His Word, so you don't necessarily have to quote it back to Him. He already knows it. That's not to say, though, that it would not be appropriate at times to simply pray God's Word back to Him. You can take a fantastic psalm like Psalm 5 and you can actually pray that prayer back to God. Why not? It's His Word. If you mean it, pray it. Or you take a good song. We sing a lot of songs that are prayers. I don't know if you realize that, but we sing a lot of songs that are prayers. We sing one that's called Hold My Hand written by Brother D. Bowman some years ago. Oh, it's a song, folks. It's a prayer. So think about that. When we're, when we're singing some of those songs, that is a song about praying to God. Number two, prayer needs to be spiritually heavy and physically light. Spiritually heavy and physically light. If our prayers are so wrapped up in this world, then how are we ever going to get our minds heavenward? We're supposed to look towards that heavenly kingdom. We're supposed to look towards that place where we are going. We need to think about this sometimes, folks. Our prayers oftentimes reflect where our heart is. And if our heart is placed upon the temple world all the time, I think we've got some serious concerns we need to think about. Number three. Prayer needs to be heartfelt. Prayer needs to be heartfelt. You'll talk to somebody occasionally who's not been a Christian for very long or maybe became a Christian and they came out of the world and they didn't grow up with prayers. I grew up in a praying, a praying family. We prayed over the dinner table. We prayed, at, we prayed at different services. We prayed at church. We prayed all the time. And so I knew the cliches to use when I started praying. Had them all memorized. I appreciate the young man's prayer tonight. That was a heartfelt prayer. It's always intimidating to pray before a sermon on prayer. I hate that job. Uh, nobody wants to do that job, but that, he did a great job. Prayer has to be heartfelt. Don't worry about what to say necessarily. But make sure you're doing it from the heart. And I will suggest this. I don't know if this is an issue here. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Write out your prayers. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with writing. Again, Psalm 5 is a written out prayer. There's nothing wrong with writing out your prayers. And I will tell you, as a, a father of young children, with the attention span of a gnat, if you're praying for 14 minutes and it's all over the place, I have no idea how to follow you. I can't keep up with you. I'm lost. And all I can wait for is the amen to know, oh, we're back on the same page now. So, so write it out if that helps you. Prayer services, that's a great time to write out a prayer or outline a prayer. This is what I want to say. This is why I want to say it, where I want to say it, and how I want to say it. Makes it a little easier for people to follow you. But again, it has to be heartfelt. To be honest, all five of these principles that are on the board there should be in every single prayer. This is who we are. This is what we are and what we do. And while they may be expressed differently, they all should be there. Every single prayer. I do not normally end a sermon like this, but Austin asked me specifically to preach this sermon, and so this is what you're getting. 
I have taken a psalm and I have reworked it a little bit to fit an appropriate, uh, the appropriate pronouns and so forth. Would you please bow with me? Give ear to our words, O Lord, and consider our meditation. Give heed to the voice of our cry, our King and our God. For to you we will pray. Our voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning we will direct it to you, and we will look up. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. You shall destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for us, we will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, we will worship toward your holy temple. Lead us, O Lord, in your righteousness because of our enemies. Make your way straight before our face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out of the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those, who, uh, let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. Lord, keep us all the way. Hold our hand. Stand by us all the day. Hold our hand. When storms of life their thunderous roars unleash, show us that thou art near. Stay by us. Hold our hand. Help us, Lord, to be a passionately prayerful people, for you are great and greatly to be praised. It's in Christ your Son's name we pray. Amen. I appreciate your kind attention tonight. It may be that there's somebody here who has not had hope or confidence in their prayers. I, I think it would be pure, uh, completely appropriate to consider a man like Cornelius, who was not a Christian, but because of who he was and because of the, the manner of his prayers, God heard him. And you know how God heard him? You know how God responded to that man's prayers? By sending him Peter. What a thing to consider. Maybe there's somebody here tonight who has not had that opportunity. We want to encourage you. We want to assist you. We want to help you. And if you have some need of this congregation tonight, this is your opportunity. We'd invite you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing.